this new coaster. This is Karen Johnson is live at the park with this big reveal tonight. Hi, Karen. Hello. You know, we have been telling you about this, even got our hands on some of the plans, but finally tonight it's official. But hold on to your hats because you've never seen anything like this before. On August 6, 2008, Kings Island unveiled the plans for their biggest project ever. At the cost of $22 million, Diamondback would be a B&M hypercoaster, standing 230 feet tall, exceeding 80 miles per hour and one mile of track. With 10 hills, six of them being over 100 feet, this was built purely for airtime, but it would have one bonus feature, a splashdown right before the final break run. As park spokesman Don Helbig said, it's exactly what everyone wants. It's big, it's fast, it's steel. Diamondback was rising right as the economy was crashing, and by the end of 2008, it was clear the country and the world was in for hard times. But Cedar Fair was still ready to invest $62 million in new rides for 2009, and attendance across the chain was up 6% over 2007. Diamondback's track was complete by January, and right after, the park opened an auction to be among the first riders. 96 people would bid for the honor, the top bidder getting to choose their seat on the first train, and everyone else being assigned a seat based on how much they paid. All proceeds would go to A Kid Again, a charity that funded trips for kids with severe illness. By March, the park had raised over $50,000, the top bid standing at $3,000, and the minimum bid rising to $75. By the end of March, the total reached $75,000, and they decided to increase the first rider event to include six trains. As the 2009 season ramped up, Diamondback was not the only new addition. This was located in Rivertown, and the whole area got a facelift with new walkways, landscaping, and fencing. There were also three new musical shows, and the ASA Action Sports World Tour would make a two-day stop in May, featuring BMX, skateboard, and motocross performers, along with concerts from Crooked X and Collective Soul. On April 18th, 256 people got to take part in the first rider event, raising a total of $102,000. 13-year-old Jackson Thurnquist saved nine months of allowance to pay $181 for a seat, and when asked if it was worth it, he said, I would have paid one billion. It is better than anything I've ever ridden. Diamondback was a smash hit, and it helped offset the mid-season closure of another major ride, Son of Beast. On June 16th, a woman notified the park that she had been injured after a ride on May 31st, and this started an investigation. She had a blood vessel burst in her brain and had to be admitted to the ICU. The Ohio Department of Agriculture wanted to know if the ride caused the injury. This was the fifth time the ODA had to investigate the ride. Coaster enthusiast and author Pete Trabuco said, The incident rate is high, and they are smart to close it down and look at every aspect of the ride. Nobody knew how long Son of Beast would be closed, and the park took it on a week-to-week -week basis. After six weeks, state investigators found no irregularities, but the park kept the ride closed, trying to decide what to do next. The woman who sparked the investigation was just one of many who came forward to contact the park, complaining of pain or injury after riding Son of Beast. By mid-August, Kings Allen announced that Son of Beast would be shut down for the season. Although it cleared inspection, there was a real concern if the ride was still enjoyable. The park would use the off-season to decide what to do next, Later in the year, Kings Island settled a lawsuit with one of the passengers from the 2006 accident, paying over $76,000 in damages. A forensic engineer testified that Kings Island's officials knew about the ride's problems from the start and tried to fix them in a band-aid fashion, causing problems elsewhere. The plaintiff, Jennifer Wright, said, My biggest hope now is the public will be aware of the issues with Son of Beast, and that situation will be rectified so nobody else has to suffer, ever. The park also continued their battle with the city of Mason over a tax on admissions. They even put a message on the marquee, reading, Mason wants to tax you. Tell them no. While Kings Island was being sued and fighting the city, Cedar Fair was seeking a buyer to alleviate their $1.6 billion in debt, and they found one in Apollo Management, buying the chain for $2.4 billion. The sale wasn't expected to bring major visible change, but the deal faced immediate objection from investors. They said the shareholders would get meager returns, and the board members would see massive profits. They also tried to force CEO Richard Kinzel out of his position, the shareholder response was strong enough to scrap the entire deal by early 2010. Kinzel, age 70 at the time, chose to retire shortly after. At the same time, Kings Island was victorious in the fight against the new tax, as the city council voted it down. When Paramount bought the Kings Entertainment Parks in 1992, they were granted the rights to the Hanna-Barbera brand through 2009. Having to say goodbye to Scooby-Doo for the first time in the park's history, Cedar Fair's contract with Nickelodeon also expired, so it was time to overhaul the entire Nickelodeon universe and replace it with their own brand, Planet Snoopy. This would cause a re-theme for everything in the area, 
Turning the Hanna-Barbera and Nickelodeon attractions into all things Peanuts. Charlie Brown, Lucy, Snoopy, Woodstock, and the whole gang. And Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Castle became Boo Blasters on Boo Hill. While Planet Snoopy was gearing up for a big debut season, Son of Beast would remain dormant. Before opening day, the park announced their Hyper Wooden Coaster would not open in 2010. They had poured $30 million into it, and they were looking for the right proposal to fix it. In the meantime, the park would remove its large box sign, and they were debating whether or not to take it off the map. In the end, they left it off. For the 2011 season, Kings Island announced Windseeker, a Mondial swing ride that would also be coming to three other Cedar Fair parks that year. This joined the Eiffel Tower and the Drop Tower as the park's 300-foot rides, tilting riders out at 45 degrees and spinning around at 45 miles per hour. 2011 would also turn back time 65 million years, with more than 60 life-size animatronic dinosaurs invading the park. This was Dinosaurs Alive, combining entertainment with education, as guests could learn about the dinosaurs and even control their movements as they walked along a 4,000-foot path behind the racer. This would cost an extra $5 on top of park admission. The park would also introduce Dinosaurs Alive 3D at the Action Theater, and that would last three seasons until the theater's closure. 2011 would be another dormant year for Son of Beast. It wasn't even on the list of rides filed with the state, so there was no permit to legally operate the ride. Cedar Fair's new CEO, Matt Wieman, came to Kings Island in the summer of 2011 and weighed in on the ride, saying the company had to be creative with it, but it's still too early to say what the right answer is. He also wanted to test out a new system like Disney's FastPass, where guests could wait in a virtual line. In July, the park introduced Fastlane, where guests could pay for a wristband and that would give them access to a special queue, bypassing the normal line. At the end of the summer season, the park tried to break a record for the world's largest human awareness ribbon. The current record was over 3,900 people, and Kings Island came well short, despite drawing in almost 3,000. The attempt did raise over $10,000 to fight breast cancer. The Crypt, formerly known as Tomb Raider the Ride, was closed after the 2011 season, the park announcing it had reached the end of its service life. The big addition for Kings Island's 40th anniversary would be Soak City, yet another massive expansion of their water park, formerly known as Boomerang Bay. This would have a $10 million price tag, and it would double the size of the park to 33 acres. It would include a new 39,000 square foot wave pool, an action river replacing the Lazy River, volleyball courts, lounge areas, and other amenities. By the end of the 2012 season, Kings Island would be gearing up for a major overhaul of the racer, including replacing sections of track, posts, braces, and ledgers, giving new life to the 40-year-old park original that had given over 97 million rides. The racer was here to stay, but Son of Beast was not. In July, park officials announced their decision to tear it down. This was the official, sad, anticlimactic end to one of the most troubled coasters ever built. Son of Beast wasn't the only casualty of 2012. Thunder Alley, the park's go-karts that was adjacent to Son of Beast, was removed after 17 seasons. There was a good reason for this. Kings Island wasn't about to leave the site vacant, and four years after the debut of Diamondback, it was time for a brand new coaster. Throughout 2013, the groundwork was being laid for the so-called 2014 project. Public records show this was a roller coaster, and not just any coaster, the most expensive project in the park's history. With a $24 million price tag, Banshee would open as the world's longest inverted coaster. Bolger and Mabillard had brought Diamondback to the park in 2009, and they would get this project also. Their inverted model was very popular in the 1990s, with fewer installations since 2000, and Banshee would be the first of its kind in America since 2006. It would be themed to a screeching female spirit, a wailing mythological messenger from the underworld. When riders reach the top of the 167-foot lift hill, the Banshee screams before twisting down the 150-foot drop hitting 68 miles per hour and flying through seven inversions. All this done over 4,127 feet of track. Like with Diamondback, Kings Island would set up a first rider auction for a kid again, asking for at least $100 per person. In April, the park invited over 1,000 media members and coaster enthusiasts to get their first rides. This was believed to be the largest preview day in Cedar Fair history. 
Don Helbig was concerned the ride would not live up to the massive buzz it generated, but it got rave reviews. Just to compliment the thrill aspect, Banshee's theming includes a graveyard in the queue, one tombstone, appropriately, dedicated to Son of Beast. This would not be the only way that King's Island would pay homage to his past in 2014. Flight Deck would adopt the name of its predecessor, The Bat. The name change, along with this new orange color scheme, would be a fitting tribute to the pioneer that made this coaster possible. As Banshee was thrilling its early riders, Matt we met stated he wanted to take Cedar Fair down a different road. He knew thrill rides were a draw, but family memories brought people back. He gained this perspective after spending 17 years with the Disney Corporation. So while Banshee gave its 1 millionth ride, Diamondback gave its 10 millionth ride, The Beast gave its 50 millionth ride, and Racer gave its 100 millionth ride, Kings Island would shift its focus for the 2015 season. The park would bring in Woodstock Gliders, a Larson Flying Scooter Ride, very similar to the Flying Eagles they just removed in 2004, as well as another addition for Planet Snoopy, Snoopy Space Buggies. This only improved on the 14-time Golden Ticket winner for Best Kids Area. Meanwhile in 2014, evidence of those little extras that we met talked about started popping up. They debuted Cirque Imagine in the King's Island Theater, an acrobatic show, and they set two world records while raising money for cancer research. One for shaving 213 heads at once, and the other for having 1,821 people apply lipstick at the same time. They also expanded Halloween Haunt, including the Slaughterhouse, a new building in Rivertown that was used for a haunted maze. Kings Island would also expand their food options, including an upgrade to the Funnel Cake Shop where guests could create a custom order, and they launched a beer festival that included three park-themed beers, Beast Bock, Banshee Brew, and Diamondback Ale. In August of 2015, the park was hyping up their next big announcement, but this wasn't for Kings Island, it would be for Soak City. Four years after its big expansion, it would be receiving a seven-story slide tower called Tropical Plunge, a set of six slides, three of them with a floor that drops out, sending the rider straight down. Keeping with the family-oriented theme, for the third time in the park's history, Winterfest was announced to return after a 12-year hiatus. After buying the Paramount Parks in 2006, one of Cedar Fair's first actions was to axe Winterfest. But with the new leadership at the top, and given the loud guest demand, this was logical for their mission statement. Winterfest would return for the 2017 season, with ice skating on the fountain, Christmas sliding scenes, a craft fair, and live entertainment. This would be included for gold and platinum pass holders. As Kings Island General Manager Greg Scheid said, Winterfest is all about family memories, family fun. But 2017 wouldn't be all about family fun. Early in the 2016 season, foundation design plans were filed with the city of Mason. This was called Kings Island 2017 Project, and it was clear it was a roller coaster. Some people thought this could be a 300-foot giga coaster, a model that other large-scale Cedar Fair parks had been receiving in recent years, like King's Dominion, Canada's Wonderland, and Carowinds. But upon further inspection, this didn't look like a 300-footer. It looked like a wooden coaster. On July 28th, the cat was out of the bag. Built by Great Coasters International, Mystic Timbers would be the newest addition to Rivertown. The park's 16th coaster would stand 109 feet tall, hit a top speed of 53 miles per hour, and feature 3,265 feet of track. This would give Kings Island 18,804 feet of wooden coaster track, even without Son of Beast, setting a world record. Its theme would be an area surrounding a lumber company, becoming overrun by mysterious Medusa-like overgrowth of vines as nature reclaims its land. But the big teaser would be, what's in the shed? After hitting the final brakes, the train would enter a shed before going back to the station, and that piqued everyone's interest. Was it a drop track? Was it an inversion? What was in the shed? Greg Scheid would leave the company, being replaced by Mike Kuntz, and he oversaw the opening of the park's new wooden coaster the following spring. He said, Wooden roller coasters used to be the only roller coasters around, but with 16 airtime hills and a 53 mile an hour top speed, the ride generates new thrills and new memories for the enthusiast. It may not have been anywhere near a record breaker, but its 16 airtime hills and twisted out and back layout made the ride instantly popular. With the modern steel monsters popping up all over the park, plus the beast right there in Rivertown, many people considered Mystic Timbers the best ride in the park. Later that year, Amusement Today awarded it with the Golden Ticket Award for Best New Ride. As for the shed, some people were impressed, others were disappointed. But regardless, everyone was sharing their opinions. Rather than giving away the surprise, I'll leave it up to you to find out for yourself. 
After seven seasons, Dinosaurs Alive would be removed, as the park was making way for future development. But it wouldn't be the only one. At the beginning of Halloween Haunt in 2018, a sign appeared at a makeshift funeral site, reading, The air is eerily calm as we make final preparations for the ill-fated demise of one of our own. The park's Twitter account did confirm this would be a coaster, and its final day would be October 28th. There was a lot of speculation over the next week. Some thought it would be Vortex. Others believed it would be Firehawk. After Dinosaurs Alive was removed, Firehawk may be next to clear enough land for a major new ride. Sure enough, the park confirmed the Doom ride was Firehawk. Serving 12 seasons at Kings Island and 18 overall, Firehawk would not be finding a new home this time. It was completely scrapped. Now, the rumor mill was hot over what could replace both Dinosaurs Alive and Firehawk. Some thought it may be a revival of Son of Beast. Others believed it would be that long-awaited Giga Coaster. By the end of 2018, paperwork was filed for something described as the 2018, 2019, and 2020 additions and modifications to Kings Island Park, and this mentioned Bollinger and Mabiard, the designer and builder of Diamondback and Banshee. In the meantime, Kings Island was teasing their 2019 attraction, stating, Something old will be new again. This fueled even more speculation about a Son of Beast revival, but in August, they announced the return of the antique cars. Resurrecting a park classic 14 years after the removal, this would be located in the Coney Mall next to the Racer, slightly south of the prior site, now being used by Backlot Stunt Coaster. These would be a two-third scale model of the 1911 Ford Model T, and per Mike Koontz, when we ask guests what they would like to see return to Kings Island, the most popular response, by far, is the antique cars. 2019 would also bring a new restaurant to Rivertown, the Miami River Brewhouse, replacing the Reds Hall of Fame Grill as well as One Team Village, a new complex of dorms meant for employees living more than 25 miles from the park. This would accommodate 400 workers at a cost of $65 per week. The park also kicked off its second Winterfest, opening and theming more of the park, adding more rides, and USA Today named Kings Island the second best park to visit over Christmas, just behind Silver Dollar City, and just months after rewarding Kings Island the number one spot for their Halloween hunt. For the 2019 season, Kings Island would offer a free ticket to one child under four feet tall for every regular adult ticket bought online. In addition to the family-friendly antique autos, the park would also welcome in the Grand Carnival, an international festival advertised as celebrating the sights, sounds, and smells of various cultures. This would be the big summer event to draw in more people, going along with the Halloween haunt and Winterfest in the fall and winter. The highlight of Grand Carnival would be the spectacle of color parade every night starting at the Coney Mall, going to International Street, and circling the Royal Fountain, lasting 30 to 40 minutes. The park may have been catering to kids and families in 2019, but behind the scenes, they were gearing up for something big. In mid-August, they told everyone to expect an announcement for a major new addition, setting up an event open to all guests in the Coney Mall on August 15th. Based on blueprints filed with the city of Mason, this was called Project X, and it was a 300-foot roller coaster. It looked like, finally, Kings Island would get their giga, and before a massive crowd, Mike Koontz unveiled Orion. Amid the chants of Giga, 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 Koontz said, You wanted it, you got it. Although it would stand 287 feet tall, it dropped into a ravine, reaching the 300 foot mark. This $30 million project would cost about the same amount as the entire park did back in 1972. But Cedar Fair was experiencing a big boom, with revenues increasing 8% from 2018, riding the business model of putting major attractions in their biggest parks. But there was some unexpected, unwelcome news the following month. The legendary Vortex, the world's first six inversion coaster, had finally reached the end of its service life. The park stated, coasters like this normally last 25 to 30 years, and Vortex was nearing the end of its 33rd season, giving almost 46 million rides. Over the month of October, people flocked to Kings Island to ride Vortex one last time. On the night of October 27th, following the final train, the park played taps and turned out the lights on Vortex for good. With Vortex gone, the park was looking ahead to the future. Orion went vertical in early September, and it was topped off in early November. 
Orion was set to open with the park on April 11th, and another first rider auction was set up. Riders would have to give at least $150 to take part on April 9th. Kings Island was booming, Cedar Fair's profits were up, and the park was creating rapid economic growth for Warren County. But the coronavirus coming to our shores threatened all of that. By mid-March, sports leagues were suspending or canceling events. Businesses were shutting down, and opening day had to be delayed. The park was hoping to reopen in mid-May. By mid-April, shortly after the supposed opening day, the park announced that season passes and all add-ons would be extended through 2021. There was too much uncertainty around when the park had finally opened. In the meantime, park officials were gearing up for a safe reopening, ordering thousands of face masks and setting up plexiglass. But they would still need to staff the park once they got the green light from the governor. They would also go cashless to avoid additional contact points and reduce their capacity by one third, allowing no more than 15,000 guests in the park per day so people could spread out. This would require a reservation system. By late May, parks around the country were starting to open up, but the parks in Ohio were still ordered to be closed. The governor announced that museums and other indoor entertainment centers could open by June 10th, but amusement parks had to wait. Cedar Fair CEO Richard Zimmerman pled his case, stating that they were experts at managing risks and following protocols, and Kings Island joined Cedar Point in a lawsuit to allow the parks to open. The next day, the governor announced that amusement parks could open in two weeks, starting on June 19th. Kings Island worked quickly to staff the park, and by July 2nd, they were open to pass holders and open to everyone starting on July 12th. Every guest would need a reservation, they would need to complete a pre-visit health screening, they would have their temperature checked, and they would have to wear a mask and follow social distancing markers throughout the park. Not to be lost in the chaos, Orion was finally ready to open with the park. Its first rider benefit was on July 1st, and it officially opened to pass holders on July 2nd. Guests would enter Area 72, the former X-Base, and its theme would be a secret research facility, one that has been studying the effects of flight on man. Flight of Fear fit well into the new theme, as did Orion, themed to a simulator that would launch riders to a new planet in the Orion constellation. This would top USA Today's poll for best new attraction in 2020. Despite Orion's popularity, Cedar Fair inevitably took a tremendous financial loss. Third quarter revenue was down 88% from the prior year, and by year's end, they had an operating loss of over half a billion dollars. Haunt and Winterfest were canceled, replaced with Tricks and Treats, a food festival. 2021 was cautiously shaping up to be a better year, with the park's opening day set for May 15th, about a month later than usual. They would also open Camp Cedar, a luxury outdoor resort where guests could rent cabins, RV sites, and take advantage of pools, cabanas, fitness areas, food trucks, and so much more. This was slated for a June opening, but that was pushed back to mid-July. But with the ongoing pandemic, Kings Allen was aware that people may be apprehensive about coming back to the park, but they were hoping that pent-up demand, as well as a hunger to go back to normal, would bring them through the gates. But like every industry nationwide, the shortage of labor became a huge problem. In order to fill 4,000 positions, they hosted a virtual hiring event and offered hourly wages from $11 to $14. This was increased to $15, and even $18 for some positions, going along with a $3,000 bonus. Despite the incentives, staffing remained a problem. On May 22nd, the park was particularly crowded, and although the rides were fully staffed, the food stands, restaurants, and gift shops were not. There were reports of one security guard watching four metal detectors. People were stuck in long lines at the food stands, and there wasn't much security inside the park. There were altercations among young people in the park, with several small fights breaking out and one big one just before 10 p.m. The park closed down 30 minutes early that night to restore order. They responded to this incident by increasing security and assuring the public that safety is their top priority. The park would start closing two hours early in June, just because they couldn't find enough workers to staff the park. Despite the shorter hours and lack of staff, 2021 saw attendance return to pre-pandemic levels. This was true not only at Kings Island, but across the industry. Kings Island would also bring back their special events, Halloween Haunt and Winterfest. Things were going back to normal, except for one aspect. The park would officially go cashless. Guests could use cash-to-card kiosks inside the park, but everywhere else in the park, only credit cards, debit cards, Apple Pay, or Google Pay would be accepted. Going into the 2022 season, the park was keeping wages steady between $15 and $18.50 per hour. They would also focus on refreshing some of its classic rides for its 50th anniversary, including a repaint of the Eiffel Tower, retracking of the Beast, and a major restoration for the Grand Carousel. However, Slingshot would be shut down after 20 seasons, and it was taken out to make way for future plans. What those plans are, we don't know, because that brings us all the way to today. What started with the flood at the old Coney Island has brought us this massive destination park today. Through all its turmoil, through all its changes in ownership, and through all the great times, Kings Island has become one of the most beloved parks in the country. But whatever happened at the old Coney Island? 
After closing in 1971 and having all its rights taken out, it reopened in 1972 with a sunlight pool and a picnic grove in 1973. In 1991, Coney Island was bought by Ronald Walker, and he started turning Coney Island back into an amusement park with small rides and even a roller coaster called Python in 1999. But in 2019, they decided to close down all of their amusement rides and focus on one thing, being a water park. This park is open to this day, so if you're in the Cincinnati area and you want to visit a park dripping in history, check out Coney Island. Thanks for joining me on this journey through the 50 years of Kings Island. If you can drop this video a like and share this whole series with anyone who may be interested, I'd appreciate it. This documentary was months in the making, so I appreciate your support. As some of you may know, I grew up going to Magic Mountain, but over the last four years, Kings Island has slowly become my all-time favorite park. From its ride collection, to its atmosphere, to its outstanding staff. So it was an honor to dive into this park's rich history and bring you its story. I want to thank everyone who lent their photos and videos to this project, including CoasterBob62, Sean Flaherty, and Jeff Joyner, whose dad, Bob Joyner, has an extensive photo gallery that he was willing to share with me. Also, since Kings Island seems to do everything well, their amazing YouTube channel was also a big help. So thank you all again for sticking through this with me, and I'll see you all in the next one.